Welcome back, everyone. Adam LaFaccia, your moderator, rejoining you. And thank you so much for joining us for our third session today. Just a reminder that if you missed either of the two earlier sessions, either the Time Place Connection or Meeting the Challenge, Inventing the Future, we have recorded both and we'll make those recordings available on the conference site as soon as we are able. So please do check back there. Also, as a reminder, we've got the questions or comments chat box on the left side of the screen. So please feel free to introduce yourself in there or ask us any questions throughout the sessions or type any comments as they pop into your mind. We're always happy to hear your feedback as we're going through the sessions today. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Paul Ceruzzi, who's going to be talking to us about how it works. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, my name is Paul Ceruzzi. I'm a uh, curator and chairman of the Space History Division at the National Air and Space Museum. And uh, I've uh, always been interested in uh, kind of uh, relationships of uh, uh, air and space flight, both with uh, navigation techniques and avionics and communications and, and guidance and things like that. And maybe if we can uh, go on this journey together, we can learn some things about it. Uh, you've been um, so far talking about navigation, which is getting from here to there. But when you're in space, you have uh, some interesting uh, things that go on. Uh, unlike, a, you think of a railroad on a track, a railroad can go forward or backward. An automobile can go forward or backward. It can go left or right. Uh, a spacecraft can go any which way. Not only can it go forward, backward, left, right, um, up or down, a spacecraft also can orient itself any possible way. It can fly backwards with the, the tail end first, as the space shuttle did very often. Uh, it gives it a lot of flexibility, but it also is a challenge. How do you control something like that? You, how do you uh, get a spacecraft to do what you want it to do? Let's say you're uh, taking photographs, for example, or you're imaging a distant planet, or you're looking for, you want to land a craft on a, a crater in, on Mars, in a very, very precise landing. You've got to orient everything, all those uh, they call six degrees of freedom, as you see from this slide. How do you manage that? And uh, one of the ways that you manage it, well, let's take a look. Uh, I, I just would mention this slide shows that navigation, which is what we've been talking about so far, is in the middle here, getting from here to there. But you also have to guide the spacecraft. That is to say, during the burning of a rocket motor, you need to point it in the right direction away from the burn of the rocket motor. I, I always uh, compare that to balancing a baseball bat on your hand. If you don't balance it carefully, the baseball bat will flop over. Well, a rocket is in the same situation with the rocket motor at the bottom and the payload at the top. You want to balance it and not only balance it, but send it off in the right direction. Control is what on the right-hand side of this slide is what I talked about. Um, orienting it so that the solar panels face the sun, so that the radio antenna faces the Earth, so that the camera faces the distant planet, things like that. Uh, so you have three issues that you have to take care of, guidance, navigation, and control. How do you do that? Well, uh, you have to manage all three simultaneously. And that's where uh, you use a whole set of tools, obviously the rocket motors, you have very small thrusters sometimes on the edges of spacecraft that just give a little puff of thrust to move it around. You have radio links to ground controllers uh, in Houston or someplace else in uh, Goldstone, California. You have onboard radar. You have star trackers. Above all, I would say, is the most important one is a stable platform, which is a device on board the spacecraft that maintains some kind of stability, kind of uh, ground uh, even though you're no, no longer near the Earth, it kind of carries a little bit of the Earth with it. And uh, the way that works is with a gyroscope. A gyroscope, I'm sure many of you are familiar with a toy gyroscope, although I have a sense that they're not quite as popular nowadays in the digital age as they used to be. But I certainly played with one when I was a child. Uh, you spin the gyro, and the inertia of the, the mass of the rotor causes it to maintain its position in space um, regardless of the forces acting on it. If you have it in a frame with bearings, as I call a gimbal, that is to allow it to flexibly move um, as the gyro spins, you will maintain that position regardless of what the spacecraft is doing. And that's very, very critical to uh, guidance, navigation, and control. And let's see if we can now go to the video about it. 
Wonderful. So we're just going to launch a quick video for all of you here on the screen. And we're also going to follow it up with a quick poll. So when it's done, keep your eye out for that. My name is Paul Ceruzzi. I'm a curator at the National Air and Space Museum. And we are now in the Time and Navigation Gallery at the museum. I'm standing in front of an inertial guidance system from a submarine. Uh, it uses a principle of gyroscopes to measure its acceleration and position under the sea. The same principle is used in space and in aircraft. I have in front of me a toy gyroscope, which will illustrate the basic concept. When you give it a spin, it maintains its position because of the inertia of the rotating mass. So uh, this is the basic principle. It keeps its position in space. Now you notice that this uh, particular gyro begins to wobble. That's because of the friction of the bearings. This is a simple toy gyro. The kind of gyros that are used here have very high precision bearings, but they do drift a little bit, and that is why we have this device in this uh, gallery, because periodically the submarine would have to take a reading from satellites to correct for that drift, which is the origin of satellite navigation, or what we now call GPS. But the basic concept of the gyro is that it maintains its position in space regardless of what's happening, especially a spacecraft which can be moving all over the place. There's no up or down in space. The gyro gives you a stability from which you can measure or uh, point yourself in the direction of where you want to go. Wonderful, and we're launching a very quick poll for you on the screen as we're talking about this technology. We'd like to know which of these have you used before? What's your technological background here? And uh, you'll notice that we've got a poll on the screen and you can click on the gray box that best corresponds to your answer. You'll notice that you can click on more than one answer as well. It looks like a lot of our early results are in, it seems like the most two commonly used are cell phone right. and Wi-Fi internet. Yeah, no Not surprise, a surprise. there. <laughs> And okay. uh, some GPS guide users, but yes. uh, fewer Bluetooth headsets. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Great. Well, we'll be touching on some of that technology again as we continue to move through the session. So we might okay. pull that up again later. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so we've already talked about Apollo 8 in one of the earlier uh, uh, sessions where it was the first time human beings left the Earth and went to another uh, heavenly body, to the moon, in December of 1968. And I put all those pieces together. It contained an, an inertial reference system based on gyroscopes. Uh, it contained radio signals uh, controlled from Houston or from the Earth. Uh, it had a celestial uh, navigation system on board. All of those things together, but the gyros were very, very significant in getting that spacecraft about almost a quarter million miles away from Earth. It had to get around the far side of the moon and execute a very careful burn of that rocket motor. You see the motor there on the, uh, on the left-hand side of the left-hand slide. You had to burn that engine very, very precisely for a, a moment of time so that it would enter into orbit around the moon. If it, went, if it burned too much, you'd crash on the far side of the moon and no one would ever hear from you again. If it burned too little, you'd go hurtling off into deep space and that would not be a good day either. So uh, it had to be just done right out of contact with Earth, that's important. Uh, they were on the far side, no radio contact at all. So they had to use the onboard gyros and the computer to calculate the thrust of that uh, a burn. So uh, you have this uh, very elaborate system of a computer, a digital computer, very similar to what you've got in your cell phone. You've got the set, set of gyros. You have the sextant in the telescope, which corrected for that drift, as, you, as I mentioned, the friction of the bearings caused the gyros to drift a little bit, so the sextant would correct for that. And you had a keyboard, similar to your cell phone uh, uh, keyboard, except this one was uh, about 50 pounds. <laughs> it had big, giant keys so that you could operate it with a sp uh, spacesuit gloves on. But that's the way it worked, and uh, obviously it worked very well. So here we have Jim Lovell on the left, astronaut, Apollo 8 uh, astronaut, uh, sighting through a sextant. Um, he's keyed in. Um, he looks for a certain star, which they had numbers they were given. They memorized the positions of certain stars. When he located a star in the sextant, he would press a button with his right hand, and that would tell the computer that the, uh, that the star is located in the crosshairs, and the computer would then 
update the uh, information, very similar to uh, the classical navigator at sea who takes a reading on a sextant and looks up the navigation tables. Instead of a printed book of tables, you have the data stored inside the memory of the computer. On the right is the Apollo sextant. So uh, quite an achievement, uh, December 1968. Um, a combination of navigation on board and from the ground. Uh, who knows when people go back to the moon or out to Mars, um, what kind of navigation we're going to use. But I have a feeling we're going to always have star charts, uh, at some at some star navigation, because the stars are out there. They're, they're, they're useful for us. Let's keep going here. There's the keyboard and display. So think of that as your cell phone uh, keyboard, uh, sets of numbers and uh, 10 digits and uh, big, big clunky keys that you could punch with a, a spacesuit on. And uh, you would uh, periodically update your position. You would give it commands to fire a rocket or uh, other things like that. Quite, a, quite an interesting early use of computers. You have to understand, I don't know how many of you know what a punch card is, but in those days, most computers were programmed with punch cards. And this was one of the very first that you could actually interact with as we're used to today. So um, I talked about the use of the gyro. Let's go to a. Um, Another use of uh, another technique that's uh, very, very important to navigation, it's called Doppler. And let's see if we can run the tape here and see what that's all about. We're now going to illustrate another very important principle of space navigation, and that's called the Doppler effect. It's something you've uh, all experienced if you hear a, a freight train or, a, uh, or an ambulance go by, that the pitch of sound changes depending on whether the uh, sound source is coming at you or going away. In spacecraft, it's the same principle, only with radio frequencies. The uh, uh, deep spacecraft transmits a uh, signal at a very precise frequency. And depending on whether the craft is moving away or toward us, that frequency shifts a little bit. And you can measure that very, very precisely so that you can get a good sense of the velocity of the spacecraft by measuring what's called the Doppler shift. I'm going to illustrate it here with a simple audio device that I purchased. And we can see if we can illustrate the principle here right in the museum. So as you can see, the pitch changes depending on whether the device is coming at you or going away from you. And this is precisely what is uh, used to measure velocities of deep space uh, probes that are going out to the outer planets and everywhere else. And uh, it's a very crucial uh, principle that's common throughout uh, radio astronomy, spacecraft navigation, aircraft navigation, GPS, you name it. It uses the Doppler effect. OK, so uh, this effect is actually found in lots of places. Uh, maybe some of you might have had an unfortunate encounter with police radar pulling over, pulling over for speeding. That's how the police know how fast you're going. Um, you uh, watch the weather report on television. They talk about Doppler radar. They bounce radar signals off raindrops, and they can gauge the velocity of the storm, whether it's approaching you or away from you. And they can really make accurate predictions about the, a, an oncoming hurricane or storm or tornado or something like that using Doppler. So the, the term is very common. Uh, and it's, it's used in a lot of places. I have this illustration of deep space navigation where you have a very large diameter radio astronomy dish. This one in particular is located in Goldstone, California. There's also one in Spain and, and one in Australia. It goes out, uh, sends a signal out to a spacecraft, in this case, uh, Mariner 10, which uh, went to Venus and Mercury in the 1970s. And as the spacecraft orbits a distant planet, the uh, radio signals uh, shift according to the Doppler effect. And that allows you to tell with very, very great accuracy uh, how fast that spacecraft is moving toward you or away from you. Now, you might say, well, well what, that's not really very much information, is it? Well, it isn't alone. But if you combine that with other measurements, such as the time it takes for the signal to get back and forth from deep space, and you take readings at uh, different times of day when the, uh, you've moved around the, the Earth has rotated, or different um, times of the year when the Earth is moving in a little different position from the, relative to the sun, 
you combine all that and you can get enough data so that you can locate a spacecraft really, really well. Uh, the latest uh, Curiosity rover landed on a crater in Mars, a very, very uh, tight little window that it fit. And that's thanks to the Doppler effect, among other things. Also, uh, to connect with what we were talking about in earlier sessions, you use uh, very, very precise atomic time standards to make all this happen because um, you are working with the speed of light. Uh, the speed of light is pretty fast. It travels about a foot or 11 and 3 quarter inches in a billionth of a second, in one nanosecond. So if you, uh, can, if you want to get accuracy, you've got to have nanosecond accuracy of your clocks. But if you've got that, which is what they have uh, here on the ground in, at the Deep Space Network, you can track spacecraft very well using the time and the Doppler effect. Now take a look at this slide. It's an interesting slide. You have the uh, dish on the ground. It's in a surveyed location. You know exactly where it is. <clears throat> you have a atomic clock located right next to that dish. You want to find out where the uh, satellite, where the spacecraft is. Now let's flip that over with GPS. GPS, you don't know where you are. You're on the ground in your car somewhere or you're walking or hiking or something like that. But you do know where the spacecraft are. You know that because the Air Force tracks them very carefully. And the spacecraft has, all of the GPS satellites have atomic clocks on board. So it's the flipping over of that uh, deep space network where you know where the spacecraft is, but you don't know where you are using the exact same techniques that I talked about of time, the time it takes for the signal to go from the satellite to your receiver. It tells you where you are, how far away you are from that satellite. And you see in this illustration there are four. If you have four satellites that you can take a reading from, you can locate yourself in three dimensions plus get very accurate time. So that's how GPS works. It's a, it's a kind of uh, based on very accurate clocks on board the satellites. And the satellite's position is very, very carefully surveyed. Uh, it's tracked by the US Air Force from a series of tracking stations. And uh, that's uh, the re combination tells you where you are down to a very, very uh, small little window of error. So GPS tells you where you are by comparing the time delay of identical time signals sent from four or more satellites in orbit. And this is an illustration here of the, uh, if you look at those, those, uh, squ those squiggles on the upper right of the illustration, you'll see that, they're, that they are kind of binary ones and zeros that are shifted. They're shifted by the speed of light uh, as a finite distance, uh, the distance from the satellite to your receiver it tells you how much of a shift there is. What you do is you slide that uh, signal in your receiver until it matches the uh, satellite. And then at that point, you know the time delay. And it's a relatively simple computation from there to tell you how far away you are from the satellite. Now, where have I seen that before? Well, when you see a flash of lightning, uh, you can assume that the, f the flash is coming at you instantly. It's really the speed of light, but you're on Earth. It's, it's just instant. You count how much time it takes until you hear the thunder. Uh, sound travels about uh, um, 1,000 feet per second. So if you count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 5, 1,000, you're about a mile away from the lightning. So uh, it's the same kind of thing where you, in, in GPS, you have the exact time uh, you count the delay that it takes that signal to get to you. So uh, the GPS system, and we talked about this a little bit in some of the earlier sessions, you need at least 24 in orbit. They're 11,000 miles above the Earth. And at any given moment, there are four, at least four in view or more. The more, the better. And it doesn't matter where you are, anywhere on Earth, the North Pole, the top of Mount Everest, the uh, deserts, the middle of the ocean, you can always get a reading. And uh, it works 24-7, all day, uh, day and night, in all kinds of weather, anywhere on Earth. And uh, it's free, too. The basic civilian signal is free. So that gives you quite a bit of capability when you consider what we talked about in earlier sessions about how 
uh, navigators at sea and in the air got lost and tremendous loss of life or, or difficulties. We've essentially solved that problem. If you have an inexpensive receiver in your hand and you go anywhere on Earth, you will you know where you are. Now, it doesn't tell you uh, everything that you need to know, obviously, but it does tell you where you are. And it works by these orbits. They are managed by the U.S. Air Force. Uh, the central base is in Colorado Springs uh, in the United States. They have other tracking stations located around the world. And the uh, satellites transmit these signals constantly worldwide. Uh, there is a civilian signal, which all of us can get. And then there is a military signal, which is a little bit more restricted. Now, we're going to get to be a little bit technical here. And I hope I can bring you along, because this is a very interesting uh, concept that all the GPS satellites transmit on the same frequencies. So you wonder, well, how is it that they don't interfere with each other? Imagine if you were on your car radio and you tune into a station at 88.5 FM or something, and there are two transmitters uh, both transmitting on that, how you, it would be a mess. Well, they code their signals with a different code. It's kind of like the, uh, you know, a, a secret coding ring or something where you, ha you put an overlay and you extract the code from each of the satellites so they don't, uh, they don't interfere with each other. They, they uh, modulate the signal with what's, what's called a, a pseudo-random sequence of numbers. That is, it's a sequence of numbers that looks random, but it isn't. Uh, you have that sequence in your receiver. It's identical to the sequences that are on each of the satellites. Each one has a different sequence in it. So you can decode these signals to get the information about each uh, individual satellite using this code. And this is a scheme which is very common. We had a poll earlier about who uses Wi-Fi and cell phones. Uh, this is a way that we are able to transmit, for example, all your computer data, internet data over Wi-Fi uh, using very low power um, without interfering um, with, uh, with uh, one another. And uh, you compare that to the old uh, classical methods of radio, where you have these giant radio towers, and they have to be very, very carefully shielded from one another. And they have to be licensed by the Federal Communications Commission so that they don't interfere with one another. Uh, all of those things, you really don't have to worry about that with Wi-Fi or these other devices, because they use this coding system to um, allow more than one uh, transmitter to operate on the same frequency uh, without interference. So it's a very significant shift in radio technology that is the basis of so much of modern society, not just GPS, but a lot of the communications and internet that we use today. And where did it all come from? Well, that's a very good question. I believe it came from the Apollo program. Uh, that they uh, came up with the idea when they were navigating or, uh, uh, Apollo 8 in 1968 to the moon. They used this sequence, and there's an interesting military aspect to it, which um, is not often talked about, that they, during the Apollo program in the 1960s, we were in a race with the Soviet Union to get to the moon. And in the early days of Apollo, there was a very uh, real fear that the Soviets might jam our communications. Now, as it turned out, they never were going to do that. They were very uh, cooperative in some sense that they, they felt like it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a voyage for all mankind, although they obviously wanted to win the race if they could, but they didn't plan on jamming it. Uh, there is jamming in the military sector, of course. But um, anyway, the Apollo designers came up with a way of avoiding jamming, which this system does really well, because if you don't have that pseudo-random code, you cannot receive the signal. Uh, that's another reason why Apollo used this onboard inertial system, which may have been pushed aside in later missions. But the uh, one advantage of the onboard inertial system is that it cannot be jammed. It's totally self-contained. And that is something that is very, very important. Uh, primarily in military uses, but it is also found in civilian aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft, and, and lots of other places. You don't always want to put your eggs in one basket. And if GPS doesn't work some for any reason, there could be a, a dozen reasons 
Uh, some could be uh, it just breaks down. There could be interference from a local source of radio. There could be any number of things. If you have an inertial system in your set that's based on gyroscopes, um, uh, you can still navigate. Uh, somebody has a question here, how do GPS jammers work? Well, they, the frequency, as I said, it's in the L band of about uh, 1.9 uh, uh, gigahertz. We know what the frequencies are. So if you built, and the, the power is very low. It's a low power uh, satellite that's uh, 11,000 miles up. By the time that signal gets here, it's quite weak. So if you construct a very high power transmitter that uh, overwhelms that frequency, you're going to jam GPS. Uh, if somebody compared it to uh, trying to listen to a string quartet in a, uh, some chamber music while a punk rock band is playing in the next room. Uh, it's not easy to do. So uh, uh, you can jam it that way. Uh, there are other things you can try to do. Uh, I, I would mention that we're very much aware of these things, and there are ways of getting around that. Uh, if, you, if you do jam, and this was something that during the Cold War there was jamming of radio transmissions, you're giving away your position by transmitting something, so you are a sitting duck if somebody wants to uh, find you and uh, take you out. So uh, uh, there are other ways that you can jam, and there are other things. Uh, one of the things that they try to do, for example, is um, called spoofing, where they generate what looks like a real GPS signal, but it isn't. And you, your, your receiver locks onto it, and you say, oh, it tells me I'm over here when in fact you're a mile away or, or even 100 feet away or something like that. Uh, it's very similar to uh, if you've ever been on the internet, you know what I'm talking about. You get, a, you get an email from somebody that says uh, Amazon.com wants, uh, uh, wants you to update your account. Please type your password in. Well, it's not Amazon.com. It's somebody who's spoofing Amazon. And you naively type your password in. And then the next thing you know, they got your password. So. Uh, that happens with GPS also, and there are ways of getting around that. Uh, so it's an interesting story. That's a great parallel, too. Yeah. Um, I, I just noticed a question that came in here from Mike in Red Lake Falls, who says one of the fifth graders in his class wants to know how the codes are assigned and how they keep track of them. There is an agency. Uh, it's a combination of the US Air Force and the Department of Transportation, which manages these codes. They, uh, they develop the codes. And they assign them. As I mentioned, the um, civilian GPS signals are public codes. And you can go on the website, uh, the uh, GPS official GPS uh, websites, and find uh, a whole section of the website devoted to these codes be uh, because they're very crucial for all kinds of commercial and civilian use. Great. Thank you. Someone has mentioned the technology has gotten smaller, and that's certainly true. If you watch that video that I showed, I was standing in front of a submarine uh, inertial guidance system, and uh, those are still in use today in submarines. Your cell phone has a gyroscope on it. Now, it doesn't spin. It, it, instead of spinning, it kind of vibrates like a, a tuning fork, but it does uh, perform many of the same functions of a spinning gyro. Your cell phone has gyro and it has an accelerometer. I always tell people, one of the first thing I did when I first got one of the smartphones is I played with it where it automatically knows whether I'm holding it sideways or vertically. How does it know that? It's got an accelerometer that measures the force of gravity, which is an acceleration. So uh, uh, all of those things are in your phone now. They've been, uh, we all know about the computer chip getting smaller and smaller, but also these mechanical devices are getting smaller and smaller as well. Wonderful, thanks. Hey, I see another question that popped in a little bit earlier from Jordan in Texas. Uh, we were talking at the beginning about spacecraft navigation, and Jordan was wondering if it's mostly manual. Well, in the case of Apollo 8, they had to punch in a lot of numbers into that computer. And uh, there was a time where they made occasionally would punch in the wrong number. And I'm sure you've all done that, made a typo keying in a cell phone number. Uh, manually, yes. Obviously, with the uh, uh, unmanned uh, probes that go to Mars or Venus or, or some places, it's got to be done from the ground. And it's very labor intensive. Now, uh, 
we see with the GPS units that are installed in your car that they give you these uh, verbal instructions. They turn light at the turn right at the next light, uh, turn left in a quarter mile. Uh, with these self-driving cars, you simply couple that information into the steering mechanism of the car, and it does it automatically. So that is where we are headed. For better or worse, it's going that way, and uh, I think that. Uh, in general, we are seeing lots more automation. Uh, the human being is still in the loop, and I'm sure most of you who have driver's licenses are enjoying the a joy of the open road, but uh, when you're in a big city, it's no fun to drive, so I'd just as soon turn that over to the GPS. I see Reginald just uh, mentioned in the chat that uh, he read that it wasn't necessary for Apollo 8 for the manual navigation, but that the astronauts insisted on having it. Had you heard that? Yes, the astronauts really um, were very uh, insistent on being in control. They didn't want to just sit there twiddling their thumbs, uh, letting someone else do the navigation. They, they wanted to be sure, and this is generally true of air, airplane pilots as well, that they were on top, of, they knew what was going on, and if there was some problem, that they could take over uh, and, and know what to do. And um, they have to be alert and they have to be aware of what's going on. A good example of that was the Apollo 11 landing, where for various reasons, the, land, the computer was bringing the lander over a field of boulders. So Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin look out the window and they say, oh my god, there's some boulders here. We can't land here. Armstrong took over manual control and he maneuvered that lander over the field of boulders and landed safely with only a few seconds of fuel remaining. But the point is that Armstrong was ready to do that. He didn't have to, he, he didn't have to do it, but he was ready. When, when the time came to do it, he didn't have to suddenly open up a manual and say, oh, hey, what do I do now? He didn't have time to do that. He immediately took over and did the right thing. And there were some other cases uh, during, in fact, almost all of the Apollo missions, they had some issue where something came up and they had to take over and they wanted to be in the loop, so to speak. Uh, this is a very big debate that goes on, for example, with modern commercial aviation, how much the pilot uh, relies on an autopilot or whether the pilot is actually in active control at, at the critical moments of flight. That's very interesting. You know, it really goes back to what we were talking about in the last session with uh, with Roger Connor about uh, all of the failed attempts at navigation, especially yes. uh, with sea travel. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear about some of the missteps that happened in space as well. We we hear about a lot of the successful trips, but not often as much about the Boulder Field that was almost uh, yes the end. There there were numerous numerous other examples. Uh, almost every Apollo mission had some kind of issue going on, uh, but uh, they all were they all came back safely. Uh, Apollo 13 is probably the most famous uh, uh, one where uh, they didn't land because of an explosion on the service module, and they had to improvise a lot of navigation techniques uh, and control. They used the lunar module and its computer to control the burn to come back to Earth. Uh, they had to use visual sighting through uh, etchings on the windows to, to line the uh, capsule up with, um, with the earth to make sure they came in at the right angle. It was a very, very uh, dicey situation, but they did come back safely. Great, thank you. I, I see we have a question here from Len in Maryland wondering, uh, in regards to the Apollo program, did we use pseudo-random coding for data or voice or both? Uh, that's a, a very good question. I'm not sure I have the total answer to that. Uh, it, one of the big uh, innovations of Apollo was called the Unified S-Band, where they had originally an earlier uh, manned spacecraft, they had one, chan one radio for telemetry, one radio for uh, guidance and navigation, they had a radio for voice, and uh, they had all these things on different frequencies and different ra radio sets. For Apollo, they unified it all into one, um, one system in the so-called S-band. And uh, they, in, they multiplexed, they interleaved everything together. Uh, the best way I could describe that is if you have a digital television, you can get closed captioning or other data about the TV show you're watching, which you never could do in the, in the old days of television. So they would interleave this, and I believe that they did um, 
they did in fact um, use the pseudo random coding for all of it, but I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I know they did it for telemetry. Great, thank you. And uh, we showed a couple of your videos earlier uh, in the presentation, uh, the Doppler and the, the yes. gyro video. We also have a, a couple more that we're sharing on our resource page. So we do encourage everyone to go and check those out when you have the chance. But we'd love if you could talk a little bit more about a gimbal lock. Oh, yes. Well, that's an, uh, for those of you who are real space buffs, this is a question that you've probably seen this come up with Apollo 11 and Apollo 13, that the gyro gives you this incredible uh, stable information no matter what you're doing. However, if the uh, spacecraft be gets into an alignment where it's rotating at the same uh, plane as the rotation of the gyro, you lose that information. And the gyro doesn't help you at all. Uh, this is called gimbal lock. In the Gemini program, they had an extra set of gimbals that prevented that from ever happening. In other words, they always made sure that the gyro was rotating in a plane that was not the same as the spacecraft itself. In Apollo, they took that gimbal out to save weight. And they thought, oh, this is never going to happen, or if it does, we can fix it. Well, it turns out that, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Apollo 11 landing was pretty dicey, and they, were, they ended up having to worry about gimbal lock. Apollo 13, they had a million things on their mind. They, had, they were running out of oxygen. They, they didn't have, uh, they, they had to use the guidance system of the lunar module as a lifeboat and so forth. So they were worried about gimbal lock. So um, it's a question that I think is mostly of interest to the space buffs out there, especially those of you who are following the Apollo story. I love it. You can never get, I can never get too much about Apollo. Just an incredible story. And at one point, I think um, they, they radioed back to Houston, uh, Apollo 11 astronauts and said, could you send me an extra gimbal? It was a sort of a joke because they couldn't, but they would have—they sure could have used one uh, during the landing. Oh well. Uh, back to the the Apollo uh, Apollo 8, where we I yes. believe looked at some photos of that earlier in the presentation. Uh, there was a lot of technology that that we were seeing there uh, that that looks pretty outdated these days. But how much of that tech would still be used today, or, or is a lot of it obsolete? The Apollo uh, spacecraft computer is one of the world's first uses of the silicon chip. In fact, I used to say that when an Apollo rocket, a Saturn rocket, took off in the 1960s, it carried with it a big percentage of all the chips in the world that existed, all of them. And today, there are more chips than there are people in the world. You know, they're making them by the gazillions every day. But uh, it was a new technology invented around 1959 or so. Uh, they um, uh, they had all these requirements of guidance, navigation, and control that they needed to uh, they needed to perform, and uh, they went they took a gamble. The chip was new, but they took a gamble and said this is a way to get all that computer power into this very compact box. And I mentioned this earlier that in those days computers filled up a whole room, and you used punch cards to program them. So they uh, they used the chip. It's the same kind of chip we use today, although obviously the density is so much more. Uh, a cell phone is just incredible what it's got on it. But um, the technology of silicon uh, is still still with us today. It's still the same invention. Uh, in fact, this is an interesting story because everyone likes to talk about how the computer chips today are so powerful. You know, you've got these little thumb drives that can carry so much. But what I think people ought to know is that this can't go on forever. And if we, uh, if we uh, don't come up with some new technology, we're, we're, we're running off of 40-year-old technology. And I mentioned the rocket itself, the, the, the basic launch uh, vehicle, that's 1940s technology, chemical rockets. We've got to come up with some new ideas. And that's where the younger people in this audience are, are you've got a job to do come up with new ways of getting us off the earth and out of the gravity well and come up with new ways of computing that don't use silicon the way we're using it now. But uh, that's the one of much of Apollo. Yes, it was primitive, but uh, it all it's all relative. I always talk about the computer. Yeah, it didn't have anywhere near the power of your cell phone, but can your cell phone do real-time vector arithmetic and double precision? 
<laughs> Probably not. <laughs> That's not in the calculator function. <laughs> well, there's a calc. Yeah, you got a calculator app, but uh, I would not trust my life to that app. <laughs> but they trusted the other. What the interesting thing about the Apollo computer is that it, it would restart, and if you've ever restarted a, a Windows computer, you know it takes a few seconds and it plays this uh, organ music or something. Well, they would re the Apollo computer would restart in a fraction of a second, which is very important because you can't wait for it to restart while you're heading to the moon uh, surface. <laughs> Well, that's amazing. I think that's something that we can all appreciate yes, today yes. with technology as yes, well. That's right. I think my cell phone takes at least a couple of minutes it takes to restart. Time to, it takes time to start, yes. And they, they designed that in very carefully that they knew that there were going to be times when it had to restart, but they made it restart very fast. Hmm. Uh, earlier we were looking at those photos of different satellites as you were breaking down uh, how four satellites can help yes. you find yourself. Uh, I, I was curious about what you were discussing as far as the military divide versus what's available to the public. You, you, you showed 24 satellites in total. Yes. You said that we need four to find ourselves. Right. How do they increase accuracy in specific situations? Is it more satellites or are there specific satellites that are more powerful? Well, they, at any time, uh, very often there are many more than four in view. In fact, uh, 24 is the basic configuration of GPS, but there are right now, I think, 30 that are operational. And uh, it can work with as few as 18, but 24 is a sort of standard. Um, the satellites are all pretty much identical, but the military signal, it uses a longer code. I guess it's, it's hard to describe without uh, a blackboard or something, but it uses longer sequence of numbers that gives it gives the, the receiver a lot more information about its location, its velocity, uh, the location of the satellites themselves, and things of that nature, uh, jam resistance, things like that. So um, it's, they're, it's all coming from the same satellites. They don't have a separate set of military satellites out there. They do have um, supplemental satellites uh, which are also in use, and I don't know, we haven't really talked about this, it's called um, uh, Wide Area Augmentation System. And this is interesting for aircraft. When aircraft land, the GPS can give you uh, a good uh, fix, but when you're landing, you want to make sure your altitude is very, very close, because you don't want to make a hard landing. And you don't want to miss the runway by 20 feet and then overshoot the runway. So you have to have your, your altitude as, as good as you can possibly get. And uh, GPS can get you close, but if you want to get that last little, you know, few millimeters or meters, you have um, a satellite in geostationary orbit near the air, over the airport, uh, over the United States, say, and it monitors the GPS system and uh, uh, is uh, sent information about the errors, the local errors. Let's say at Dulles Airport, there's a local device that tells you that GPS is off by uh, th six inches in this direction or something like that. It sends that information up to the satellite. The satellite then sends it back down to the aircraft and says, OK, shift your GPS position by six inches according when you're near this airport or, or something like that. So that is a, is a supplemental satellite. You don't need it. But it's there, and even civilian receivers have it called WAAS augmentation. Uh, the military has other similar devices in theaters of war where they have specialized dedicated satellites that augment the basic GPS constellation. But in general, the 24 satellites up there for civilian use, it's there. Everybody in the world can use it, and it's pretty good. Now, when you talk about geostationary satellites, are, yes. are you referring to satellites that are always permanently hovering above or directly above the same spot on Earth? If you send a satellite up to 22,000 miles, approximately, its, its orbit around the Earth is 24 hours. A satellite in low Earth orbit takes about an hour and a half to orbit. A space station is about 90 minutes, maybe a little longer. But at 22,000 miles, uh, it's 24 hours, so it appears to hover directly overhead because it matches the rotation of the Earth. Uh, your Direct TV or other television, direct broadcast television, uh, Sirius XM radio, 
things like that, they are coming from geo geostationary satellites. That's the name of them. They're called geostationary because they appear to be stationary. In fact, they're moving, but they're moving because we're moving too. GPS is about halfway there. GPS has 12-hour periods. That is to say, uh, it, now it, circum it covers the Earth in 12 hours, uh, makes two orbits per day. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, but uh, I won't get into that. But um, uh, navigation, there are navigation devices in geostationary orbit. The primary use of geostationary is for communications, also weather. They take pictures of the, uh, uh, hover over a particular area of the Earth and take pictures of the weather. Your weather satellites often show that. Um, there's also uh, military reconnaissance, uh, Google Earth, things like that. Uh, Google Earth some t uses some that are up there and some that are closer to get more high resolution. Hmm. Wonderful. I just want to very quickly point out that we've launched an evaluation link in the top left-hand corner of the screen. And for those of you that were with us earlier in the day, you know that there's no need to click on that if you're planning on sticking with us for the final uh, the final session that's coming up in just about 15 minutes. But if this is your last session for the day, then please do take a moment to click on that. We'd love your feedback. I'm also going to pull the schedule up on the screen. And remind you that if you missed any of the sessions, or you'd like to review any of the content or share it with someone who wasn't able to watch it live with you today, we are recording all of these sessions and we'll make them available on the conference site. That being said, it looks like we're all done with the questions from our participants. Thank you so much for everyone who submitted one. So I think we'll wrap up this session for now. And I just want to say, Dr. Paul Ceruzzi, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah.